Here's our organ introit today. Well, welcome to Dale Mead Church. It's delightful to have those two guests, those musicians join us via the internet, people that I don't know, but I met yesterday as I was searching for a organ intro for our service today. I've asked Ivan for some more samples, and so hopefully next week we'll get another rendition from Ivan Pettigrew in Chilliwack. In Psalm 47, one and two, the psalmist says, Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a jubilant cry, for the Lord Most High is awe-inspiring, a great king over all the earth. Let's join together and welcome the Holy Spirit to be with us as we worship together today. I want to finish reading the rest of that psalm for you. I'll start again from the beginning. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a jubilant cry, for the Lord Most High is awe-inspiring, a great king over all the earth. He subdues peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chooses for us our inheritance, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God ascends amid shouts of joy, the Lord, amid the sound of trumpets. Sing praise to God. Sing praise. Sing praise to our king. Sing praise. Sing a song of instruction, for God is king of all the earth. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the peoples have assembled with the people of the God of Abraham, for the leaders of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. This last week uh, on Thursday was the day that the church celebrates the ascension of Christ. And so that's why I chose this psalm today. In verse 5, it says, God ascends amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sound of trumpets. That wasn't exactly the way that Jesus ascended into heaven, but it gives us a nice picture of us recognizing that Jesus is Lord. But in Acts chapter 1, Luke, the writer of Acts, writes for us what that experience was like for the disciples who were there. Reading from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. I wrote the first narrative of Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, 
is what you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, at this time, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. And so it was that Jesus ascended into heaven. And from that day until now, we await his return. As the angel said, that he would come back the same way that he went. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday the day that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we will look at something dealing with Pentecost next week. I have a song that I've chosen uh, uh, by special request from someone. He touched me and I had a little bit of help in choosing the rendition that we're listening to do today. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> but I will let you go into small groups now. And if you want to talk to people in your small group about why you feel so tired, you can do that. Uh, I feel tired because I was working on my vehicle yesterday. I had a few problems, but I got some uh, coaching help and uh, managed to get through some of those problems and I'm making great progress. Uh, so uh, let me just, oops, that's not what I wanna do. I wanna put you into breakout rooms. Oh, I'm stuck. <laughs> we lost it. <laughs> Are we back in the breakout group or what? You're, you're back in the main room now. I don't know. Okay. So, if you sneezed, bless you. And sorry you get cut off so abruptly every week. You do get a little warning, I think. A 30 yes, yes, we did. Yes, we do. I, yeah. okay. I was a little lengthy in my discussion and my dissertation, so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> we no could, apologies necessary. You weren't lengthy at all. <laughs> we could give you a guest speaker spot next week if you'd like, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> let's not get let's not get carried away. <laughs> I think we should do that. <laughs> The first group uh, for uh, sharing of prayer requests is Brenda and Liz and Pete and Elsie. Okay, I, I will report for us, okay. Um, um, Brenda said her prayer request was for Liam again. And, you know, that's for, as we all are praying for Liam too, that this bone marrow transplant will be very, very successful. Um, Pete Nelsey, he says he's just grateful to God for all the little flowers that are popping up and there was no planting at all involved. So, <laughs> so he's just grateful for that. Um, he had, they had a great time yesterday visiting with family on social media and he said it was um, just one flowers. coffee cup after another no, as they were doing it. You know, so. And um, yesterday um, there was a cougar in amongst their cows and there had been a calf born and um all was well yesterday with it but they haven't been able to check this morning yet but they they caught it all on um on uh, video or on a camera so um they, they were very sure that's what it was uh, the prayer requests i have from a friend of mine um her name is rosie and her husband is terry their daughter was killed in um a motor vehicle accident 
for sundry on May 6th, and it's just been extremely, extremely hard for them. They're a very, very close-knit family, and uh, Cassandra still lives with them, and uh, they just, um, you know, I, I know Cassandra, and she just she was just a really fun, fun girl, you know. So just pray that um, they will just be comforted, that God will just comfort them. Um, and also for my friend Lana, who lives in Ontario, she will be scheduled. She hasn't got the date yet, but she'll be scheduled for open heart surgery uh, the end of this month. And um, she has an aortic aneurysm just where the aorta comes out of the heart. So it's very, very dicey, dicey surgery. And we just pray that the, the surgeon will um, be guided by God at this time. And I, I think that's probably it. Ken is not with me right now because we were doing our road bleed this morning with our family. It was the only day they could do it. So he's just finishing up with them. That is it. Just thankful for the good weather. Okay. Thank you so much, Liz. The next group is uh, Joan and Ralph and Rosemary and Arnie and Wanda. Good morning, everybody. We have plenty of prayers of gratitude today. I'm so pleased to share. And of course, uh, we're, we're giving endless prayers of gratitude for the fact that Liam progressing very well. He had his bone marrow transplant just this past week. Uh, and after like about 12 hours of having three sessions during this bone marrow transplant, he woke up uh, happy and sitting up in bed and he's just progressing really, really well. Um, and he's, you know, dancing to Shania Twain. So we're so, so delighted about the fact that Liam has done so well. So very grateful. And may he continue to progress with a very, a very successful healing process. And of course, we can we continue to um, pray for Rosemary and Ar Arnie's granddaughter-in-law, Alex, as well, for her journey to, to better health. And also, Ralph, is, Ralph also has another prayer of gratitude because he's had his second vaccination with Pfizer, and now he has no pain. He, he does not have any of his arthritic pain that he had been previously having, so he's extremely grateful about that. Um, and then we also wanted to uh, make a little uh, prayer request for a bit of rain. We are so grateful for the beautiful weather, but if we had a little rain at nighttime, that would be a blessing as well. Thank you. Well, if the forecast is any indication, we might be getting snow on Friday and Saturday, but we'd really like that to be rain. So let's pray that direction. <laughs> um, I did wonder, along with Ralph and Joan, if um, Liam's bone marrow donor maybe loved Shania Twain, and that's what gave him the, the desire to, to dance along with, with her songs. Uh, the next group is Dale and Kathleen and uh, my Elaine. And Sharon. Sharon, Sharon is here with me and she is our recorder. All right, uh, <laughs> Kathleen was happy to um, be able to have this um, silver lining during COVID uh, to be able to um, interact with people um, during this time um, in this church setting and that the tone is not feeling like you're being spanked is her words. Um, it's feeling inviting uh, to thrive in the Lord, and it's an accepting environment. Um, Elaine mentioned how much chickens can do for us. She's very thankful for the chickens, and she picks dandelions for them and is very grateful. She had no idea that chickens could add so much to your life. And being close to the road, she thought maybe the birds wouldn't come around and she just loves the birds if you can hear in the background we're outside and the the birds love this area and they're also the um, trees are blooming the bees are around and sometimes she just sits under the trees and listens to the bees humming in the trees and it. it's very therapeutic for her um, Dale is thankful for fixing his car this week that it wasn't too difficult our um, prayer request is I met one of my neighbors. Her name is Monica. Her sister was um, 44 years old and suddenly passed away last week of a stroke um, from blood clots. She uh, leaves behind an eight-year-old little girl. So we'll just keep Monica and the niece in your prayers this week. 
Thank you, Sharon. Uh, the next group is uh, Elaine McKinnon and Kelly and Nancy. Good morning. Uh, Elaine was out enjoying the, the weather and everything in the yard and uh, walking around having a nice morning. And we were lucky enough to have breakfast on the patio this morning with the uh, family. So that was great. Um, so we're all thankful for the, the weather. Uh, Elaine would like to say some prayers for her friend Dave, who's got a very serious head injury. And Nancy and I would like to uh, say some prayers for Caitlin that um, she can uh, find more normality in her life. And, and uh, she's got a good job and working good at that. It's just a few things are unsettled that, you know, we're hoping that uh, God can help her work those things out. Yes. <laughs> And that was it for our group. I missed the very last thing you said, Kelly. Oh, just that that was it for our group or that Caitlin is just a little unsettled. She's She's got a good job, but she's just got some stuff she needs to sort out. And we're praying for God to help her with that. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's pray together. And maybe after we pray, I will change my uh, internet connection because I don't want to, um, I'm not seeing everything. Everybody's frozen all the time. So I'll do that in just a few minutes after we pray. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the life that we see in the world that's around us and for all the ways that you remind us of who you are, how you touch us and you touch people in our lives and you do things around us in the environment that remind us of your creative, restorative and healing ways. Thank you for the weather that we can enjoy, for the beautiful sun and the, the green that we see around us with new life coming in plants and trees and new life in the animals that are around us and the calves and the chickens and the birds and the bees. I pray that we would allow those things that we see to ignite in our spirit where there is something that needs to be aired out, or something that needs to be rejuvenated, we pray that you would do that. We give thanks for Ralph's release from pain after his second vaccination. We give thanks for the healing that you were bringing to Liam's body, and we pray that you would continue to do that. We give thanks to the hope that you bring to each one of us and the way that we can meet together here in this forum during this time of COVID. And we pray that you would continue to strengthen each one of us. Bring rain to our lands, Lord, to our prairies, to the farms, to our homes, and continue to bring the life that you bring with your living water, not only to what we see around us, but to our spirits and to our souls. Also bringing healing to those places that need healing. We pray for healing for Alex. We pray for healing, ongoing healing for Liam. We pray, Lord, for healing through surgery for Lana. And we pray, Lord, for Caitlin, for her to find healing and normalcy in her life with the guidance of her parents and her family. And we pray also for Dave, that you would bring healing to his head, to his brain, to his body after his trauma. 
We ask, Lord, for you to be with those who are experiencing grief, not only because of COVID, but for other reasons. We pray specifically for Monica and her family and the passing of her sister. We pray that you would give them comfort and grace and hope in times that are very, very difficult. And we also pray for Rosie and Terry and their family, Cassandra, that you would bring comfort to them in the loss of their daughter and sister. Our life, Lord, is short. And even though we are alive, we look back on our life and see how quickly it has passed. Help us with each day that we have to live it with the fullness that we are able to. Come into our spirit with your spirit and liven us so that we can experience all that you have blessed us with. That all of our senses, our spirit and our mind can enjoy the life that you give us, that we can give praise to you and then we can encourage others to enter into life along with us to experience the joys and goodness and get through the trials with the help of your spirit. We give praise to your name and we acknowledge your ascension and look forward to your return. And Lord, I add a special prayer for the people in the Middle East. I pray that life would be recognized as being sacred by all and that you would bring people to a place of desiring understanding with each other, that the Israelis and the Palestinians might be able to find a road to peace with your help, with your guidance. We ask these things in your name. Amen. I invite you to turn on your microphones and read with me our mission statement. Here we go. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Therefore, therefore, therefore I, am somebody. I am somebody. The power of Christ is within me. Here is our finance address. If anybody wants to make a donation towards the church for our operating expenses. And I'm just going to try to adjust my internet connection. Hopefully I can get a better reception that way. Just give me a moment. And in just a moment, uh, we'll get Liz to read the scripture. There, can you hear me again now? Yes, clear as a bell. Great. Okay. I hope that's better then. Yeah. Okay. So I have put the scripture reading into the PowerPoint and I hope that Liz and I were able to coordinate well enough that uh, what she's reading is what's on your screen. Liz, you can go ahead and read the scripture. Okay. Scripture this morning is from John 5, 1 to 15. And it's, it, the heading in, in the NIV is the healing of the poor. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people uh, used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed and they waited for the moving of the waters. 
From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one with the pool, um, the first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease he had. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was, was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Liz, for reading that for us. Uh, this is a very short encounter that Jesus had with this man at the pool of Bethesda. At the beginning of the passage, it says that Jesus uh, made his way to Jerusalem for a, a festival. Uh, this is a modern day picture of Jerusalem that's taken from the Mount of Olives. Uh, beautiful, uh, with the sun shining on the city. And of course, the most prominent thing in the picture is right in the center near the front, which is the Dome of the Rock, a Muslim edifice, just to the left of that. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? That's the El Aqsa mm -hmm. Mosque. Thanks, Dale. <laughs> Uh, and this area here that's all flat around the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque is the area that's called the Temple Mount. And where the Dome of the Rock is or somewhere in that area is likely where the temple was located, where Jesus and the rest of the Jews would have gathered for this festival that Jesus went to Jerusalem for. <laughs> there is in Jerusalem a very wonderful model now of Second Temple Jerusalem. And this is what the model looks like of what the temple may have looked like at that particular time. There's a fairly good description of the temple, but this is a temple that was rebuilt by Herod. It's called the second temple, but really it should be called the third temple because the second temple was rebuilt by Herod to be uh, particularly glorious. Uh, and so the Jews would have gathered here for their festivals. <clears throat> and you can see down here, there's a, a large staircase, and this is the entryway that people would have come up into the Temple Mount via. And then there is this open courtyard, and then the inner courtyard, and then the temple itself, inside of which only the high priest would go on certain holy days. Just off to the right of the Temple Mount, in this corner, you can see this fortress-like structure, and it's called the Antonia Fortress. It was built by Herod, and it was named after one of his, uh, one of his people, uh, Anthony, and that's why it's called the Antonia Fortress. Uh, and you can see a lot of the different housing that archaeologists speculate what Jerusalem looked like, and you can see different walls, and sometime maybe we can talk about some of this different archaeology. We won't talk about it today, but this is probably a, a richer section, and this is a little bit of a poorer section. In this area here that's to the left, is what's actually called, and we don't see very much of it in this picture, is called the City of David. And that is originally what the city would have looked like when David came into the city, just this smaller region off to the left. And the temple, of course, was built by Solomon after David. Uh, a more recent picture, rather than from the time of David, but probably about 100 years ago, is this photo where you can see the sheep. And I thought, Spring, it was great to see what maybe Jerusalem would have looked like about 100 years ago with uh, some shepherds, with their goats, and with their sheep outside the walls of the city. Going back to the model, we can see beside the Temple Mount and the Antonia Fortress, this little building section here. 
And this is actually where the pools of Bethesda are located. And so this gives you a little bit of a context of where this incident would have taken place. Somebody's labeled, up, labeled it for us. So now this is looking at it from a different direction. The temple is over here. And here's the Antonia Fortress. And here are the pools of Bethesda. So this gives us a great introduction into what happened during this incident. There are some artist renditions of what this might have looked like. Uh, here is an angel, of course. I don't think it looked like this, but the, the painting is certainly influenced by the times during which it was done. And here is another one showing lots of people who are standing around, an angel coming down. The angel is going to stir the waters. Uh, and with the number of people that are there and only one person getting healed, you can imagine that the area might have been a little chaotic at times. And think what might it have been like for this man who has been there for 38 years. The angel comes down. This is obviously even a tradition in Jesus' time. People know about it. And if you have a particular ailment that is somewhat nasty, then you can go to this pool and it might give you some hope. It's a little bit like maybe some people thinking about the lottery. If, if, if I could just buy at the right time, at the right place and get the right ticket, then things will be better. And with lots of people needing to be healed, you don't know whether or not you're going to get cured. There's a little bit of a mystery with this angel. The angel is obviously a messenger of God, bringing God's power down to one very fortunate individual. The angel brings <laughs> healing, but this healing seems to be limited to this one person. Why is it just for one? There's no sense of limitation over the ailments from the scripture that we have. <laughs> you could have any disease, any sickness, but if you're the first one that's in the water, you're the one that's going to be healed. So the power itself isn't limited in its strength, but the power seems to be limited in terms of who is going to receive it. And there's a little uncertainty too, because the text just says the angel would come down from time to time. What would it be like if you were the person that was sick? You're there, you're waiting. The angel hasn't come for quite a while. And you're wondering, when is the angel going to come? Should I get up and go to the bathroom? Should I go and get a snack? What if I go and chat with somebody and the angel comes down and I miss it? Do you sit by the edge of the pool on the edge of your seat just waiting? And for how long do you do that? And what happens in your body as you wait and you wait and you wait? You know what it's like to wait. We're waiting for COVID to be over. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for Liam to be healed. We're waiting for all of these things to happen. And if you're waiting by the pool, what's your anxiety level going to be like? And when somebody else makes it to the pool before you, how does that make you feel? Why is somebody else more fortunate than you are? Why does somebody else get the healing and you don't? And then we're introduced to this man. He's been sick for 38 years. Either John himself knew this or it was later revealed. 38 years is a long time. In fact, 38 years is longer than Jesus' entire life on earth at this point. Jesus is only about 31 years old. So this man has been sick for a very long time. What's happened for you in the last 38 years? Where were you 38 years ago? This is how long this man has been sick. And when Jesus approaches him, his response is, somebody always gets there before me. There's, there's no number system. I, I, I've been here for 38 years. I've been waiting. And as I was preparing this, I could just imagine in the back of my head Ralph saying, well, let's get you down there then. And ready to do something to make sure that this problem would be taken care of. When Jesus starts this conversation with him, there aren't really any introductions. Jesus is, it's like he's going into the crowd. What took him to the pools of Bethesda? You know that Jesus wasn't going there because he himself was sick. He was going there in search of somebody who wanted and needed healing. He doesn't tell the man who he is. And from the man's reaction, it's pretty obvious to me at least, 
that this man didn't know who Jesus was. This is probably at the end of Jesus' first year of ministry. And so the people in Jerusalem aren't really familiar with him yet. He can still walk around, not like up in Galilee where word is spread. Because if people had known that this was Jesus, the man who could heal, all those people at Bethesda who were waiting for healing, I'm sure that they would have been clamoring around him. But they didn't know who he was. And Jesus just went to talk to this man. And he asks him one question. It's three words in Greek. I don't know how many it would have been in Aramaic, but it certainly wasn't very many. Do you want to be well? It seems a silly question. What do you think this man is doing at the pool of Bethesda? Of course he wants to get well. But this isn't how the man responds. When Jesus asks about do you want, this is a, a, a question of desire. And this word is the same word that Jesus uses in the conversation that John recorded with Nicodemus about the wind blowing where it wills, where it wants to. So the wind blows according to its desire. So Jesus is asking this man about his desire. And then he asks him to be, do you want to be well, to be this be? means to become or to be made. And it's used 14, oh sorry, it's used three times in John chapter one, verse three, where John describes the fact that all things were made by him and there was nothing that was made that wasn't made by him. So John is using this word that he's very familiar with about Jesus making things from the time of creation. And now he's asking this man if he wants to be made. And then the last word is well, or whole, or sound. Metaphorically, this word can also mean to not deviate from the truth. Do you want to be complete? Do you want to be sound? Do you want to be made whole? And that word wholeness or wellness occurs 14 times in the New Testament, and seven of them, half of them, are in the Gospel of John, and six, uh, seven times they happen in this very passage. The other three times, it's in the Synoptic Gospels, where Jesus heals a man's hand. The man had a crippled hand, and Jesus made it whole. He made it complete. He made it finished again, like he's recreating another time. And so Jesus is asking this man, what's your desire? What do you want to be made? And do you want to be whole? Do you want to be well? His response is, well, he just can't get there in time. He's not really answering the question. It's an indirect response but it's pretty clear that he wants to be well. He has a desire to get to the water, but somebody always gets there before him because he doesn't have anybody to help him get down to the water. How many people had he seen get well in his 38 years? How many times did he wonder to himself, that should have been me? Does he wonder, will it be next time my turn? Or will it be somebody else? Will someone be here next time to help me get there in time? Dare I leave here for even a moment in case the angel comes and I might be the first one at the water? How much dedication did he need to have in order to wait and hope for that possibility? When have you had a reason you thought you couldn't be healed like this man. I can't get to the water in time. There's no one to help me. Yet he didn't say to Jesus, stand by me and wait with me. It's my disease. Why should you be inconvenienced? He didn't respond to him bitterly. He didn't beg. He didn't even say, heal me, because he didn't know who Jesus was. What caused Jesus to act? Because the passage is very quick. 
It's a three-line story. Jesus has two lines, and the man has one line. We've already heard his line, and we heard Jesus' first line, which was, do you want to be well? And when he explains that I don't have anybody to help me get into the pool when the angel comes, Jesus just says to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And that's the end of the conversation. There's nothing about what you want. There's nothing about go wash in this pool of Siloam. There's nothing about do this or do that. It's just get up like he's already healed. Something miraculous is happening in that conversation. And instantly, the man gets up. When he gets up and he moves, the legalists are out. The naysayers are there. The people that aren't helpful in the situation are around. These are what John calls the Jews. It's very interesting that John refers to these people as the Jews. Well, wasn't Jesus a Jew? Weren't all the people Jews? But John uses this phrase, the Jews, as a way to talk about those people in authority, the people who are lording it over everybody else and telling them about all the rules that they need to follow, all the regulations. And instead of recognizing this man who's been at the pool for 38 years, waiting for healing and rejoicing with him that he's healing, they're saying to him, what are you doing carrying your bedroll at Sabbath? Don't you know that? You shouldn't be carrying your bedroll on the Sabbath. These are the members of the Sanhedrin, the heads of the nations, the authoritative legal people. And they ask him, so what are you doing this for? And the man says, well, the man who healed me, he told me to do this. Obviously, if somebody has healed me, he has the power to heal me and he tells me to do something. I'm going to do it. It's not like I was intentionally trying to break the law, but I'm obeying the one who's brought me life. I'm obeying the one who's changed my life circumstance for the last 38 years. And I'm reminded about what Jesus says in another discussion at another time about the Sabbath. That the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Jesus, not like the angel, has access to healing in a very different way. The angel was like a conduit the one who is bringing healing from God down to the pool to one fortunate person. Jesus is the embodiment of healing. Wherever he goes, he is able to heal people. He offered something to the woman at the well. He brought healing to the man at the pool. Jesus sought this man out. And he knew because this man was close to the pool, he must have known when he said to him, pick up your bedroll, get up and walk. Jesus must have known that this was going to create controversy. They're in Jerusalem. The feast is happening. The legalists are out. The police are going to be there watching. And he's sending this man into a storm of questions. Of course, the man is thrilled that he's healed. He doesn't mind that he's carrying his bedroll. He hasn't been able to carry it for 38 years. He's delighted to carry it. And the legalists are there. And Jesus set this all up. Why did he do that? Why did he do it on the Sabbath? Why did he do it by the temple? Why did he tell the man to pick up his bedroll? Jesus is a little bit of a pot stirrer. He likes to get in the middle of things and make it sticky. He likes to get people to think about what's really going on, to think about what's really important. But at the same time, he's making the world 
a better place for those who are oppressed. And he's making the world more challenging for those who lord it over others. So where does this leave us? What does Jesus' healing of the man by the pool of Bethesda have to say to us or is for us? We've seen through this story what Jesus can do. We believe that Jesus is alive. We read earlier today that Jesus ascended into heaven. And we believe that he can heal. Jesus is doing something deeper than what the angel did. The angel doesn't have conversations with pool, people by the pool. The angel doesn't tell people to pick up their bedroll and walk. But Jesus is using this healing at the pool as a way of getting into the society in a way that he wouldn't be able to otherwise. Indirectly, he's stirring up controversy with the legalists to demonstrate what the power of God can do for people and to show people that this power is actually more important sometimes than following legalistic rules. He's demonstrating that healing is a gift from God and that as we receive those things from God, sometimes following rules that were created for man, not man for the rules, isn't as important. Jesus is doing something deeper, something at a, a level that's more, more meaningful, not only for the individual, but he wants others to know this. Note, though, that Jesus did not go around the pool and heal every person that was there. There were still other people at the pool that were waiting to be healed, but Jesus didn't go to them. Jesus went to this one man. Why didn't he heal everybody there? Other people didn't know it was him. They didn't ask him for healing. They didn't approach him. It says that Jesus slipped away into the crowd, and that's why the man didn't know who he was. But later on, Jesus bumped into him at the temple. And basically, he said to him, go and live your life without sin. So that something worse doesn't happen to you. This is a little bit mysterious. Was he actually equating that sin happens to us because of bad things? I don't think that's the interpretation, although that's what I've read in some commentaries. This is important. I think that the interpretation here is that Jesus is saying, go and live life in the freedom that God gives you. Enjoy new life with God. Take everything that God has to give for you and enjoy from it. And rejoice. Don't turn back. Don't go back to what your life was before. Because God is renewing you. God is giving you something wonderful and rejoice in it. And I think that's God's message for us. Is that he says to us, here am I, like the woman at the well, I have living water for you. Come and drink from my water. Do good. Come and receive mm. my healing. Come and enjoy the new life that I have to give you. Don't turn back. Don't go back to your old ways. Because what I'm giving you is so much better than what you've had before. Walk, rejoice, and serve God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as each of us allows us 
as you allow us to think on our 38 years of whatever we've been waiting for. What is it that you are inviting us to? What is it that you are saying to us, do you want to be well? What is it that you are leading us into that is better than what we've had? We invite your Holy Spirit to speak to each one of us and for us to know what that path is ahead. It's going to be different for each of us, but to know that the life that you offer, the living water that you offer, the touch that you offer to us will make our life different, better, full of your life how we can be made whole, how that part of us that isn't sound can be made sound. And help us to continue to keep our eyes focused on you to walk that path towards wholeness, embracing what you have for us. Come and touch us. Come and tell us to pick up our bedroll and walk. Come and see our sickness and bring us your healing. And we give you glory and honor. Amen. May Jesus be the one who comes to bring you whatever it is that you need healing for, whether that be in your body, in your mind, or in your spirit. And may you know that he is the carrier of God's healing power. He is the one who holds it. And he has the creative force in him for you. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know that Wanda has at least one announcement, maybe more. Um, just before I pass you the mic, Wanda, let me also say, um, I neglected to send one update on Thursday after we heard some of Liam's progress. And what Joan and Ralph mentioned to me is that the next 100 days are quite crucial for Liam. So we talked about having 100 days of prayer. So if you want to join in that idea, just think about it as 100 days. And we are three days away now from the end of the 100. Thank you, and uh, Wanda, on to you. Thank you very much, Wes, for another powerful service. Oh you give us a lot to think about, that's for sure. And I love, I love exactly what you said the message from God is, go and live life and rejoice. And uh, yes, that God is such a creative force that we can leverage. Thank you. I just wanted the uh, no particular church announcements, although I just wanted to mention if anybody has young people who are looking for a part time job this summer, I saw through the Langdon community Facebook page yesterday that there's a Saskatoon farm east of Lyalta who's looking for uh, somebody to help them part time seasonal work 20 hours a week, they need a driver's license. So I just wanted to share that in case anybody knows of anybody who's looking for something in the summertime. <clears throat> Other than that, I hope everybody enjoys this gorgeous sunny day. What a day. It's beautiful. It is. And if anybody's looking for some socially distanced fellowship, I know that there are some people after church who are going to be headed off to a, a nursery to buy some plants and flowers. Uh, <laughs> if you're interested, put your hand up. I'll tell you where to go and maybe you can meet them there.
enjoy. It sounds like fun. Yeah, I think they might be. I, I saw mom's hand go up. So maybe that other party can get in touch with her. Uh, I think that might be Chinook Nursery, might be one place. And I can't remember what the other place was. Does the, 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 the party want to put their hand up or open their mic and tell us where to go? It would be kind of nice to meet them with Rosemary and Arnie. And I would Annie. I would like more plants, but my husband told me I have enough. <laughs> <laughs> there does there does come a time when you have enough plants. Never, <laughs> never. No, Ralph. Never. No. <laughs> Please. You must at feet. one point be happy. You have to be happy. Our, uh, our grandson, Greg, came and helped us plant our plants yesterday. Yes, I failed to give thanks for grandchildren. And he was a six foot dude that moved in here and just took up the, the, the shovel and the rake and he did a great job. What a job. I'm, so, I'm trying to find I, some sheep manure so that I can put that in my flowering beds and my flowering pots. And uh, they say locally here, there just isn't any. It's not available. Does somebody know where you can get some? And what is that? Sheep manure. Sheep manure. Oh, I yeah. prefer sheep manure to steer manure because it doesn't smell so much in your neighborhood. Now we really need <laughs> Elaine McKinnon. We she might we have had a, a big on that. What's that? We had a big bag of manure yesterday dropped off here. It was well rotted and uh, the smell is gone. There is no odor. I recommend it highly. And where did it, where did and you he, get it? And where did they get you? At Home Hardware in Strathmore. Okay. It was just excellent stuff. I tell you what, it, it really... Uh, the, the bed is just uh, so much better for it. Um, it's of more, course. yeah, it, it, uh, it was well turned. It had been well, uh, well, um, sit, you know, it, it has been screened. And uh, I know the difference between good manure and not. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody's interested in good llama poo, we can supply that. Well, there you go. But it also smells like everything else. <laughs> Let there be no. Uh, yeah, it, it uh, probably doesn't uh, have any great different odor about it. Uh, we had a banker friend that said he grew the biggest potatoes and was the winner, I think, in this contest. Really? This fertilizer. Well, that's wonderful. <laughs> Who was this banker? He was the uh, credit union manager in Strathmore. You probably really? know him. Yes, I probably do. Well, I must say it's a, it is a necessity. Well, thank you for your powerful sermon, Wes. Thank you, was, Wes. Yeah. yeah, it was very, very wonderful. Very grateful, Wes. We are. You're welcome. Thank you, Wes. Yes, that was great explanation there. Great. Good words. That's for sure. Bye for now, then. Bye-bye. A great week, bye everybody. Bye. Have a good day, everybody. Have a great day. Have a good week.